So that's really it for um, our guideline updates for 2020. Nothing, you know, nothing earth shattering, hopefully for folks uh, that's gonna change too much of your day-to-day -day practice. I wanted to, um, at this point, add a few discussions about some changes that are specific to COVID-19. So the first of these is our contagious respiratory illness policy, which hopefully folks are familiar with at this point, which is the policy that allows us to leave a patient on scene even though they're not specifically refusing care. And that's a huge, and I hate to be cliche, but paradigm shift for EMS. Normally, if somebody calls us, either they're a non-patient or they're a patient, and if they're a patient, they either refuse care or we transport them. Um, a pandemic has changed our thinking on this. And as it says here, in order to preserve EMS and hospital resources during times of incredible stress on the system, it may be prudent to leave low risk patients at home. Now, as it turns out, our curve here is so flat that we really haven't overwhelmed our healthcare system or EMS yet. In fact, in many cases, ERs and EMS agencies are less busy than they normally are. So we're being very judicious about um, the use of this, uh, but I have been involved in at least one um, use of this, not in, um, in uh, Rio Rancho, but it is, it is happening on a very limited basis. If the peak that we expect to come, and I am talking about this on recording this on April 16th, and I don't know when people are going to be listening to this and things are changing so fast that this may be before a peak. This may be before a peak that never comes or you may be watching this after a peak that came. But at this point, we're being judicious. But in general, contagious respiratory illness, of course, the appropriate PPE. The good news, it seems like PPE is working and just had a very interesting webinar yesterday with a ICU doc at Cornell in New York City who is in the thick of their um, surge there. And instead of having 40 intubated patients on their service, they have 400. This is a huge hospital. The entire hospital is just doing basically COVID-19 care. They have not, knock on wood, laminate. They are not having providers getting sick in the hospital since they started doing just routine good PPE. The providers that got sick, a lot of them got sick at home or they got sick early before people were aware of the risks and you know we're just treating patients with an extended period of time with no protection at all. So it seems like the PPE is working. So minimize crew exposure and the use of PPE. This is all old news at this point. Perform your initial history and physical. Um, this does need to include vital signs, so there has to be some contact with the patient. This is ideally happening outside wherever possible. This is, if it's inside, minimum number of providers uh, going in to preserve our PPE. And then, if we're transporting the patient, okay, this is, this is standard care here. We still like to put a surgical mask on everybody, uh, mixed as to how well it works, but it certainly doesn't hurt anything. Supportive care, as we would always do for patients, we are trying to continue to avoid nebulizers for these patients. If you have a patient who you are you know, this is their asthma. They've had no exposure. They've been quarantined, isolated at home. They've had no exposures. They have no fever. This is just like all their prior asthma. Um, and you're gonna wear an N95 mask. You know, nebulizing is not completely unreasonable. 
but in general we're trying to be very restrictive about that um, if positive pressure ventilation must be applied um, we would like to use uh, filters um, if they are available on a bag you can use your ventilator as well um, we would like to have as much airflow through the back of the rescue as possible and of course as few people as needed in the back of the rescue with an N95. We are not, again, knock on wood, we are not seeing providers caring for patients in these settings that wearing N95s that are appropriately fitting getting sick. So it seems to be working, but you also have to be completely, you know, um, just paranoid basically about not touching your face and cleaning your hands and how you not just put that on but doff that PPE when you're done. And of course by now everybody is familiar with the rules at different hospitals for triaging and notification. This is kind of old news. All right, so if you have a patient who you're not immediately transporting and meets low risk criteria, um, which are listed here, I'm not gonna read through all of those, um, just a reminder that at that point you can contact an MSEP, and this is specifically the consortium or myself. We can have a conversation about whether or not you know we're going to transport that patient. We're going to be factoring in the assessment and the low risk criteria, but also the current situation in the healthcare system and how overwhelmed we are to make that decision. This could be a Zoom consult. Uh, this could just be a phone consult. The one that I was involved in recently was simply a, a phone consult. And then there is the post encounter need to uh, make some follow up with that patient and give them the appropriate documents that we have uh, put together or the specifically the EMS fellows have put together. So hopefully everybody has seen this and this is a review. But what you haven't seen and I'm gonna mention now is our crisis standards of care, cardiac arrest guidelines, which is something that we've worked on across the EMS consortium and uh, across Sandoval County, but have not enacted yet because the state has not declared this a disaster. And at that point, when you declare the health uh, secretary declares a disaster, we go into crisis standards of care, disaster standards of care. So all the rules change. We could implement it sooner. We don't have to wait for that. But the whole issue is how overwhelmed is the EMS system and how overwhelmed are the hospitals? So um, and the other thing is how prevalent is COVID in our community? So we don't have great data yet. The health department as of today has not been breaking out the information to us beyond the county level. And we know in Sandoval County, a lot of that data reflects uh, what's happening on the Pueblos. So this is the draft, but to make you aware, we have the option to implement this at any point. And what this means is that we are not going to resuscitate patients and expose crews to additional risk for patients with very low chances of a good outcome, nor are we gonna tie up ICU, ER and ICU resources for patients with a very low chance of a good outcome. And so we will be, you know, Essentially, if you read through this in detail, one of the things it's gonna tell you is that if a patient doesn't, is not in a shockable rhythm, whether that's an AED saying shock advised, or this is a, on the monitor and we're seeing VFib, VTAC, we're not going to resuscitate that patient when we enact these guidelines. The other points here that is worth mentioning and with that, this would be appropriate to implement now. If you are um, managing the airway of a patient that has 
you can apply this to every cardiac arrest, or you can choose to do this on the patients where you think there is some concern for um, COVID, then when you are taking a mask off the face to manage the airway, so that could be taking the non-rebreather off, this could be taking the mask off from mask ventilation. You want to pause and in order to insert either um, our LMA type extraglottic devices or to intubate, you want to pause CPR. You could imagine that pressing on the chest is going to generate aerosol and we don't want any added risk to providers. I have no evidence that if you're in an N95, there is actually a risk to you but still let's take the precautions. And then um, there is some question about whether it's better to have a extraglottic device in place or an ET2. And this is dealer's choice. The latest ILCOR AHA guidelines do recommend a preference for an endotracheal tube. It surprised me a little bit that they made that statement. That is based on the idea that a cuffed endotracheal tube should eliminate, if there's no leak, and sometimes there's leak, if there's no leak, should avoid any aerosol generation from around that tube. And that if you have an extraglottic device in place, um, depending on how well that's seated, maybe there's a risk of some aerosol generation. That has to be weighed against the fact that to do the intubation, you have to be much closer to the patient's airway than to just open the mouth and stick it in an LMA. So I sort of look, say it's like trading off a little more risk upfront for a little r less risk later. And that's up to the operator. If you think that this patient can be, you know, relatively easily intubated and you're going to you have your N95 on and you're going to pause respiration uh, pause CPR and you want to give a little more effort at a intubation than you normally would, that is fine. If you decide to go straight to an LMA, I think that is still fine. One of the things we would recommend is that you either um, make you know, extra sure that the mouth is kind of closed down around your tube taming device, or some people are putting some gauze around the tube in the mouth, or just a towel over the face, just to make sure that aerosol isn't coming out around that device seems very reasonable. One last reminder, we have not enacted this yet, at least as of the time that I'm recording this on April 16th. This could happen, you know, before you ever hear this presentation. It may never happen. We don't know. All right. That is all I have on 2020 and COVID uh, guideline updates. If you have questions, please funnel those through uh, MedComs and back to uh, the education staff and Basically, any way you want to get a hold of me, I am more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you.